Welcome to Gossip About Gossip, powered by Hedera Hashgraph. In each episode, we'll cut through the hype of blockchain promises and explore real-world examples of organizations creating the next generation of decentralized applications, which will bring trust back to the internet for us all. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Gossip About Gossip, the podcast where we talk about real-world applications of distributed ledger technology. My name is Zenobia Godschalk, and I'm the SVP of Communications here at Swirls Labs, helping to grow the Hedera ecosystem. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Brett McDowell, who is the president and chair of the Hedera Governing Council. Hi, Brett. How are you? Hi, Zenobia. Um, doing well. I'm glad to finally be off the road for a while and uh, recovering and then getting back, getting back to the work that we do here. Indeed. So we, I think, saw each other in person for the first time in maybe three years um, a few weeks ago out in Davos. You had a very, very busy schedule out there, and I want to talk a little bit about what you had the opportunity to do within um, the World Economic Forum, and we can go into a little bit about um, you know, what the main conference is like. But I think it has helped a little bit if our audience knows your story a little bit better. So um, can you give us, you know, I know a lot of folks know you, you've been in the Hedera community for a long time, but for those who are newer to our story, can you give us a little bit of your background and experience? Sure. So um, I think there's probably two themes I would, I would highlight in my career that, that led to and, and makes for a good fit here at Hedera. Um, one is the consortia building. So I, I've been involved in industry groups, either as a participant representing my employer, um, largely in technology innovation, uh, more, most of the time, specifically to uh, either driving a, a innovation into becoming a global technical standard uh, for the whole um, internet community to take advantage of and use. Uh, sometimes it's been around driving policy changes, uh, again, for the benefit of the entire uh, internet community. Um, and along the way of building different consortia, uh, such as you know, Liberty Alliance, Kantara Initiative, Fido Alliance, DMARC Working Group, um, and all the others that I've had a hand in, um, like the you know, MOG and uh, just too long of a list to really get into. But what the theme that ties them all together is the second thing I would call out. And that is digital identity specifically around um, privacy and security uh, and, and cybersecurity. So starting in 2002, I had my first formal role in um leading uh, industry standards efforts specifically. And that was with Liberty Alliance, which produced identity federation standards. So web single sign-on and introduced the model, that three-party model of you've got a user um, uh, who needs, or it's sometimes referred to as the subject. It's their identity that's a question. Uh, you have an identity provider who works on their behalf so that they can assert their identity with trust. Um, they can make appropriate claims uh, to third parties, otherwise known as relying parties. And that model has been with us quite a long ways. And now uh, we are into kind of the newest model, which is decentralized identity. So between building consortia, getting technology companies, especially competitors together in the same room to build consensus, and find the, um, you know, the, the self-interest, enlightened self-interest where we want to share this technology with the world to grow a pie, and then we can compete with each other on that slice of the pie. That's been a theme throughout my career, and then specifically working in digital identity and cybersecurity for the most part, and really happy to bring those two themes together here at Hedera obviously building the Hedera Council and working with them to find that consensus, um, but also helping them 
uh, put their efforts behind industry standards and public policy changes, which kind of brings us back to why I was at the World Economic Forum. Yeah, and I think, you know, we have been uh, in the in this in the DLT industry, the conversation does seem to have shifted over the last six to twelve months, as it does in many industries, right? Where it sort of starts off in silos, and then people realize that there is more benefit to working together, to having some standards, like you said, to be able to um, you know to articulate what that broader pie looks like. Let's paint a picture a little bit of you know. We, we heard a lot about Davos. We heard a lot about the World Economic Forum. There are almost two components to it. What happens, um, you know, in the environment and then also what happens in the forum itself. And you got to participate in the forum. So um, for those of us who didn't, can you share a little bit of what that was like? Sure. And I think the model um, that, that people understand if you've ever been to any conference um, is the show floor versus the meeting sessions. And often the tickets are different. Um, the ticket to the show floor is different. And some people go to those conferences, they never leave the show floor. So in Davos, um, the main street called the promenade, that's the show floor. You walk up and down that street and you visit the different businesses that have rented out spaces. That's where we had Hedera House um, shared with Africa House. And you know that's kind of Anyone who's ever been to a conference can understand that model. And then at the World Economic Forum, actually going to their meeting, well, that's like having you know the ticket that, that gets you into the sessions. And even there, um, there's a lot of competition, more competition than is normal at a conference for getting a seat in the room. And so, first of all, you need to be uh, viewed as a contributor with something to share with the broader membership in order to even be invited to attend the World Economic Forum. Um, so we've been uh, members of the World Economic Forum for a number of years, uh, but this year uh, we were actually invited to participate uh, in the meetings uh, directly and in part because I was invited to um, participate in the Digital Identity Initiative panel um, and asked to bring kind of a historic context to digital identity, going from the first kind of personalized websites and being able to start logging into websites back in, you know, 95-ish, all the way through Identity Federation and what Web3 promises with decentralized identity. So that was my role, but I also got to attend a number of other sessions. And this year we were also invited to be what's called a unicorn member. Um, and that put me into a community so one thing that the World Economic Forum does that's different from what normally would be a, a conference experience is they build communities, specifically named and curated communities um, of stakeholders. And so Hedera finds itself in what's called the unicorn community um, and technical pioneers. And so that was a fantastic experience in working with lots of other um, you know, industry leaders who are running companies for the most part, uh, some organizations. Um, but building community, making those connections, building relationships, and then engaging on some strategy work in smaller sessions, really small rooms, maybe a dozen to 15 people. Um, again, that's not typical at a conference, but the really small meetings where we got into, okay, what are some of the, of the strategic priorities that the World Economic Forum wants to focus on when it comes to Web3, crypto, and blockchain? And I'm, I'm guessing you probably can't share the names of your other community members, but can you give any um, sort of context for the kinds of folks or the kinds of discussions that you had in those sessions? Sure. So uh, the meetings are uh, held under Chatham House rules. Um, so that's what that's the, the level of, of confidentiality that's involved, simple Chatham House rules. And um, so we some of the themes that we engaged in you know, some sessions were very large, very large uh, session where it's more, and it was even broadcast um, to all the members over video, uh, some of those sessions. And that's, that's really listening to a panel give a talk. So I attended a few of those, focusing on things like central bank digital currencies um, and, uh, you know, the, the state of startups uh, in the market today 
and you know how to you know best practices for navigating austerity. So some some large panel discussions like that, um, and in the smaller forums uh, we got into again more detailed on CBDCs and what kind of the market needs next from a thoughtful deliberative body like the World Economic Forum. And we identified um, some things that we thought were missing deliverables that might provide guidance to the central banks and also maybe some missing dialogue uh, for the innovators to listen to the central banks and what their pain points really are versus what they might be presumed to be. So really good conversations about coming together you know, uh, technology companies and central banks around what that looks like. Uh, obviously, the digital identity initiative that uh, we're a part of uh, here at Hedera, talking about what's the what's needed as a priority in digital identity going forward. Um, and in general, uh, happy to say that one of the themes um, that I believe is an outcome of some of the smaller room discussions with the leadership around blockchain, crypto, and Web3 has been to shift the focus from what the technology could be used for and focus on what the technology is being used for. And that was sort of summarized as shifting our focus away from use cases, which almost implies the theoretical application of a technology to a problem, and really use the terms case studies and hold ourselves to that bar of, of highlighting, discussing, and promoting and advocating case studies so that if we make it clear to uh, policymakers and uh, companies that haven't yet taken advantage of Web3 technologies that this is solving real world problems already and pain points you might have. And so take another look at this, turn away from the hype, turn away from the theoretical, and focus on the practical and what's already being done. So that was an, a nice kind of progression in some of our internal discussions. Yeah, and then, you know, your panel in particular was focused on digital identity. And like you said, you've been in this space for a long time. Um, WEF is not typically in the business of sort of rehashing old technologies. It is about, you know, being forward looking and thinking about the new um, adoption of technologies and innovations to make the world a better place. So how, how did you talk about digital identity in the future and sort of the, you know, what, what in terms of Web3, what does that really mean and how can we, you know, continue to move forward from what we have today? Yeah, I would say the, the group wants to identify the pain points, right? They, they want to really identify blockers uh, in particular, any policy blockers? Is there something governments can be doing? So we haven't really got into this dimension of the World Economic Forum, but they have, uh, I believe, a keen role to play in putting public and private sector together in collaborative dialogue. So they want to understand you know, what can be done on the public sector side. So we workshop some questions, uh, we went through the history, we talked about it from different perspectives and what's been a barrier. And essentially what we kind of came up with as an area of focus, there's more than one, but the one that <clears throat> really resonated with me was um, to focus on almost policy level interoperability. So we have the technology standards. Frankly, there is standards work that needs to still be done. So I don't want to dismiss that, but that's happening. It's not like that's not a pain point where the WEF needs to come in and really drive um, through some kind of roadblock. I think we've got, you know, the community is doing what the community does with innovation. There's kind of competing standards. There's some things, it's, wor it's working itself out. Um, people are getting together. So that's progressing. But what may not be progressing as well is trusting the process. So let's say you have a process standard for um, giving someone a government-backed identity, or even a commercial, commercially-backed identity claim. You've verified their identity, but who is going to trust the verification that you put them through, right? So you've put someone through verification. Um, and how are you going to get that process trusted by the next relying party? 
and what technologies does that te relying party need to deploy in order to even receive an assertion of their identity. So technical standards and adoption technical standards is a piece of it, but also adoption of trust frameworks of standardization at that level so that you, the individual isn't put through that verification process over and over again. This is not a new problem. This is a very, very old problem in the space. Great technologies have been deployed to, to great effect, frankly. Um, Identity Federation is largely ubiquitous across enterprises. Uh, it's pretty common on the web itself um, through certain very popular identity providers. Um, uh, but what we still don't have is that sense of real portable identity. And so uh, we spent a lot of time talking about why that's important. So not just what needs to be done in terms of unblocking the trust between institutions that we rely upon identity verification, but also the benefits to the individual and the benefits that Web3 provides and decentralized identity provides um, can largely be summarized and focused around privacy. And this is not anonymity, this is privacy. And one of the things that, that I have dealt with for a couple of decades in the digital identity space, I brought forward and gave it a, a name and it's called the Panopticon problem. Um, and this is where your identity provider sees your activities and it's concern of like, what are they seeing? What are they recording? How might they use this information? Um, and it creates a barrier, a trust barrier. Whereas if you can swap out that identity provider with smart infrastructure, more capable infrastructure itself, well, now the relying parties are going back and they're getting their claims and they're checking signatures on the ledger. And so the ledger, the infrastructure um, can be trusted to uh, provide the evidence so that you don't have to keep asking the same entity. And I don't want to dismiss the good work that's been done and kind of double and triple blind privacy architectures that have been introduced to try to mitigate the, the privacy risk of the Panopticon problem. I just want to call it out as a problem that did hold Federation back from maybe fulfilling all of its promise and one that the Web3 doesn't really share that same problem. Um, and not only can you use the ledger to address the Panopticon problem, but you can go further with zero knowledge proofs and other privacy enhancing technologies that really get quite granular around protecting one's privacy. And that is completely separate and disconnected from the concept of anonymity, right? This is privacy when you want to assert your identity, you know, which is the more common commercial use case. Right. And I think, you know, you've seen in Web2, there are plenty of um, large social media companies who would be happy to help you sign on to anything and everything and then know anywhere and everywhere that you go. Um, so, you know, I, and, and to your point, we've done a lot in terms of identity. If you work for a corporation, right, enterprise identity across your various, um, you know, instances and applications that you use. But, you know, you're talking now about identity that is, you know, global, that is considered for citizens of different countries, that is potentially borderless, that has much larger implications than um, just your corporate identity. And it and it, identity with with kind of the common denominator being the ledger and cryptographic signatures. You you end up being able to do a lot, right? It's not just identity. Now that ties into tokens, tokens that um, maybe the token is representing your identity, right? We've got soul bound tokens and other NFT related identity use cases as well, but you've got tokens that assert ownership over property ownership over intellectual property and tokens that are you know simply financial instruments. So it's all very tied together. It's all in the lingua franca of public key cryptography. And you can you can just move you can remove a lot of institutional overhead and efficiency and cost in which sometimes that that intermediary uh, also introduces fraud and corruption or just abuse, um, lack of transparency, right? So they're just a laundry list of benefits. Getting back to some of my earlier comments, use cases and the theoretical application of this technology and how it, may, it can address um, you know, everything from 
uh, you know, getting people credentialed with identities they can wield in the digital age to climate change and the like. Like, let's get, we, we still need to keep our eye on where the technology might go, but let's really focus on the use cases and how these digital identifiers, when we say digital identity, it, you know, people are going to hear person identity, right? That's what they're going to think. They're going to think kind of identity card in my wallet, you know, what's my name, other attributes of my identity. Um, but we're seeing a great use case on Hedera today of decentralized identifiers and verifiable claims that have nothing to do with human identity. It is Internet of Things use case. Um, I should say case study because it's actually happening live in production today. Um, and, you know, it's easy to point to the highest volume use case on our network right now, you know, Atma IO and their use of the Guardian open source policy management engine, uh, which is great for any kind of tokenized end to end workflow. And it's using digital identifiers and verifiable claims. You know, was this the use case people had in mind when they spec'd out DIDs and BCs? No, it's not. But it's a great application of the use case. Um, and this is the kind of storytelling we need the WEF to engage in, highlighting what's actually happening with the technology, um, even if it might be a novel or un unexpected use of the technology, and how to bring those benefits to other situations where they're not yet enjoying the benefits of Web3. Um, especially in the historic context of coming off the heels of 2022, when this technology um, was associated with fraud and corruption itself. Ironically, since this is proof of action, you know, reg tech at its best, anti-corruption technology under the hood. So it is ironic that that happened. Um, it happened in good old uh, good old fashioned fraud. It was not a use of the technology. It was not even an abuse of the technology. It was an abuse of trust, trust that was put into institutional intermediaries instead of trust that was left to a trustless public key cryptography ledger. Yeah, taking those carbon-based life forms out of the equation of trust, right? Well, Brett, thank you for you know opening the um, you know opening the curtain a little bit and sharing with us uh, what you were able to learn and engage in at WEF. Um, any other thoughts before we close out? I would just say that you know I'm certainly no expert on the World Economic Forum. Uh, this is uh, our first real deep engagement uh, with the World Economic Forum on practical projects, but I am very optimistic um, that they uh, do have the convening authority and the reach to put, to put stakeholders together, especially public and private sector stakeholders together in a constructive dialogue um, so that society benefits from these innovations. Um, and while, while society also protects itself from the worst abuses surrounding these innovations. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Brett, so much. And we look forward to having you back on soon. Thanks, Zenobia.